Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening or good morning from uh, those watching online in other parts of the country or in other parts of the world. My name is George Sfinnis. I'm an engagement manager at Standard Australia in the ICT sector, and it's my pleasure to moderate what will be an incredibly important conversation Standard Australia hosts this afternoon on Digital Twin. Now, we are at Standards Australia offices here in Sydney, so I'd like to begin this afternoon by acknowledging the traditional custodians of, on the lands on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Now, digital transformation is occurring across almost all sectors of the economy and at a pace that we've not seen before. With the exciting launch of this digital twin uh, white paper, it signals a monumental opportunity for Australia to take the lead on Digital Twin, both from Australian experts participating on, uh, yeah, in, on the international stage, on internationally aligned um, standards, uh, but also for industry and government here in Australia to actively use Digital Twin in projects. So coming into this conversation, I think it's fair to say that there's a consensus in the room that um, advancements in Digital Twin technology is going to reshape the way we do things. It's going to reshape things like the construction sector. It's going to reshape uh, the provision of infrastructure. It's going to reshape uh, planning. Um, but on the flip side, I'm also conscious that for each of you in this room, Digital Twin might also have a bit of a unique uh, meaning or the use cases of, of Digital Twin might be unique. So we will try and be as broad as possible. A special thank you to the authors of the Digital Twin White Paper, Adam Beck and Gavin Cottrell, and we're lucky enough to have them on the panel this afternoon. A special thank you also to the internal team at Standard Australia for making this possible, uh, especially Shannon Brown, Mary Beth Bonner and Romaine Crawford and your respective teams. And finally, a thank you to the Department of Industry, Science and Resources for your support in publishing the Digital Twin White Paper. Now, we will have some time at the end for, for a Q&A. You will see a QR code on your screens. And for those online, you'll also receive a link to enter the Slido um, chat. For those in the room, we will be doing a traditional Q&A um, at the end of this session. So without further ado, I might uh, introduce today's panel. So firstly, uh, Adam Beck. Adam is the Head of Digital Urbanism at Enerhub. Uh, which is an Indara company, one of Australia's largest digital infrastructure companies. Adam is chair of Standards Australia's Digital Twin Working Group, a co-chair of the Internet of Things Alliance Smart Places and Infrastructure Workstream, and a member of the Digital Twin Partnership Leadership Team. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Meredith Hodgman. Uh, Meredith is the policy lead for the Internet of Things Alliance Australia. Meredith sits on the Parramatta City Council uh, Smart Cities Advisory Council, and is also the Director of Innovation Ecosystems at Tech Central for the Sydney Greater Cities Commission. And Meredith joins us today on behalf of the Internet of Things Alliance Australia. Welcome, Meredith. Gavin Cottrell. Gavin is the Founder and Managing Director of GC3 Digital, a digital twin advisory and consultancy business. Gavin has developed and led international and national digital twin programs, Gavin's a member of the Standard Australia Digital Twin Working Group, the Internet of Things Alliance Smart Places and Infrastructure Workstream, and the Digital Twin Partnership Leadership Team. Thanks for joining, Gavin. Last but definitely not least, Claire Ripley. Claire is a Strategic Initiatives Manager at Standards Australia, actively working in the critical and emerging technology space. And the Strategic Initiatives team has uh, published the Data and Digital Landscape Report uh, which has highlighted standards in air, key areas uh, in the in the tech space, including digital twin. Welcome, Claire. So I'd like to start, Adam, in sort of sixty seconds. For those who might not be familiar with digital twin, what actually is digital twin, and what are some of the most um, common use cases of digital twin to date? In sixty seconds, um, I, I think many of us know. A, a general shorthand definition of digital twin as being a digital replica of a real entity or process. Um, so we're not going to sort of reinvent that. I think there's an element of the definition that often gets somewhat sort of overlooked, which is what is the capability of that digital replica, the, the sort of the, the sort of the tool or the platform that we want to use to activate data. And that's where 
the digital twin really gets exciting, I think, when you look at it as a set of capabilities. The definition, of course, uh, by default has this idea of uh, data transferring between the digital and the real. So connectivity is sort of a backbone capability of digital twin. And then there's uh, some real important but also challenging capabilities around integrating data, disparate data sets coming together. Sounds easy but always very challenging. And then when we've got those data assets in our hands, our ability to analyse them, uh, simulate, is another one and then of course visualize you know bringing that insight into multiple dimensions so um uh, kind of a simple idea but uh, when you look at the back end and you look at those capabilities something that's really powerful and of course across those capabilities touching on existing tools and processes we have like building information modeling and gis uh, and the like so um so, so look a, an aggregation of capabilities to really bring data to life common use cases very diverse often you know uh we, we talk about asset optimization you know built form assets horizontal vertical infrastructure we're seeing use cases emerge around economic development at local government level um and i think you know there's there's going to be ongoing use cases that emerge as organisations in, in embrace the opportunity. Um, but those classic categories, environment, you know, climate, economic development, transport, mobility, asset optimisation, um, no, um, uh, no, no real surprises there. Yeah, it's really, that's really interesting to hear. And I guess pivoting to Australia's strengths, Gavin, um, what, what have you observed in your work that what, what are Australia's strengths and what, what have we capitalised on? Yeah, really good question. I think the best way to answer that is in two levels. I think first is around strategically in terms of the strengths. We're seeing top-down investment from business case work that's been done through Digital Twin Victoria through the live New South Wales project. We're seeing South East Queensland uh, looking for funding for their program. So what that says to me is in terms of this is not a bottom-up approach. This is top-down generating investment jobs, building capability for us that's helping drive strategic objectives. It's not a bespoke thing that sits within a department. Um, building information modelling has, has suffered that a bit. IoT suffered a bit. There's discretionary funding, but having a, a top-down approach is a real strength. I think what we're seeing is that the leaders of East Coast around uh, Victoria, New South Wales and, and Queensland really driving that, and we're seeing over in WA with Landgate in terms of their, their business case and we're starting to see conversations as well in South Australia and, and others. So for me, that really sets a, a really strong foundation for what to, to build upon. With that, we have a lot of technical expertise in this country and something that we tend to overlook and there's got a huge amounts of capability in our private sector, so whether that's in delivery or from a technology perspective. So we've got huge opportunities there and strengths to, to build upon. I think what we now need to do is to start putting that into action in terms of how do we start to move from the pre, proof of concepts and start actually delivering the more of these use cases moving forward. So I think in answer to your question, that strength, that top-down leadership is really uh, is a fantastic thing for us to, to move from. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. And I, I note you did touch on the jurisdictions and so we've seen – uh, states like New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland take a lead on Digital Twin. Um, Meredith, why is Digital Twin important to Australia and why is it important to the broader economy, actually using Digital Twin in projects? I think um, building on what Gavin just mentioned earlier in terms of our unique strengths here in Australia, it's important to take a step back and look at the key industries that the Digital Twin sector and indeed the tool itself influences, whether that's government and speed of government decision-making whether that's the built environment and building optimization or digital technologies themselves, the advancement of AI or cybersecurity, right through to advanced manufacturing and critical infrastructure, resilience, and ultimately defense, right back on the wheel. We know we can have a look at those industries and we can really reflect on a couple of key things that they have in common. 
Firstly, being that they are global growth sectors for a number of different reasons, massive booming opportunities, whether that's because there's high demand or whether there's very specific, unique talent and expertise here in Australia that can deliver upon that, like in computational and data science, um, or whether it's because of our natural resources, et cetera, or whether it's because perhaps some of those industries like advanced manufacturing and mining might be so lowly digitalized right now, we know there's some immediate growth. The second big driver, I would say, is that it is building on that natural strength of Australia. So massive global growth sectors, natural strengths of Australia, but then finally they are globally strategically important, whether that's to our nation or to our region or globally. So we look at innovation around the world and quite often you'll see booms and growths come from what you might call the burning bridge. And you sometimes we think, oh, we're so privileged here or we're very, um, you know, very high standards of living, et cetera. But Australia's burning bridge is our scarcity, whether it's our remoteness, whether it's our small amount of people, whether it's our small, relatively small economy. So the digital twin comes in and it offers a foundational layer across all of those industries to be able to catalyze quite significant strategic growth by providing a layer that supports the supply chain that by across all of those industries. So by focusing our investment on one area or prioritizing investment into this area, what we're really doing is unlocking a growth boom in key priority sectors for the whole nation and regionally. Yeah, really, really great answer there. And I think one thing you, you touched on which was important and I think well, one on the flip side, the, the danger is that while some jurisdictions have taken the lead, so New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, um, one might then presume that some of the other states and territories in Australia are lagging behind. So I guess a question to, to the panel is, um, how do we ensure that there is that equal um, distribution of, of digital twin capability in Australia? And how do we ensure that there is that national framework and nobody's left behind? I, I, I think I'll, I'll take a, a bit of a look. I mean, we're, we're in Sydney at the moment in New South Wales. You know, I, I suppose it could be seen that from a smart places and smart infrastructure perspective, New South Wales has a bit of an unfair advantage because the political leadership was there at a state government level. So I think there's always going to be leadership, you know, state by state, territory by territory that nationally will, will just happen. Um, and, and I think uh, turning to the, the, white, the white paper, for example, referencing that, you, you'll see in those recommendations a, a strong level of, national connectedness, that there's certain roles to play for each level of government, if I just talk about government for a moment. So to ensure that no one's left behind on digital <laughs> twin, um, we, 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 we're going to need some national leadership there and some national program and investment. Um, it's still good for states to, to go forth and, you know, carve new territory and invest and they'll have their own use cases and, and opportunities. Um, I think it's also going to get interesting when you get down to the local government level as well, you know, 535 whatever local authorities around the country. So it even gets more interesting in terms of making sure others aren't left behind. Um, but I think knowledge exchange and sharing and making sure those that take a lead then share uh, and, and and we get that good cross-fertilisation of, of knowledge and lessons learned. I think, um, I think that's going to be critical for Digital Twin to ensure those kind of outcomes that you speak of. Can I add to that, George? Adam, you say New South Wales has a bit of an unfair advantage, but I'd potentially suggest that they've taken a hit for the national team and that when George opened, he talked about different definitions of digital twin and things like nomenclature and we know, I think everyone in the room here would know there's a massive challenge to be addressed in terms of use cases and adoption and communicating things. So to your point about lessons learnt, I think it, someone had to go first and I do think that perhaps some of the states and territories identified in this paper as not being ahead of the curve right now will have a beautiful advantage in being able to learn from all of these lessons and have a much stronger rationale and a much stronger case to go to their internal governments and seek the right and the most appropriate leadership both at the state level and hopefully indeed the national level. Just adding on that, I think it's really important for us to understand what the problem we're trying to solve with Digital Twin the states and territories are responsible for their own built environment, as it were. The federal government isn't responsible for that. So I think what's really important that each state has the opportunity to drive its own agenda, to solve its own problem statements, and that needs to happen. And what we're seeing with SEQ is a big focus around in terms of housing, 
delivering the games, et cetera, which would be different what's going on in Victoria where it's supporting the, the, the big build. And I think that's really important that we understand what is the problem we are trying to solve. And I think for me, this is why in terms of from a, a national conversation, how do we, how do we help uh, deliver better exports? How do we create new jobs? How do we drive innovation? So well, what we've got to do from a national approach is rather than just saying, well, look, New South Wales are doing this, Victoria are doing this, the others, what we've got to do is think about what does this mean in terms of Australia, public limited, et cetera. Well, how can we actually export our skills? How can we export our services? How do we create market conditions to allow research and development to build? Um, I'm going to Tel Aviv and Europe later on this year to do a knowledge share around digital twin startup technologies. So I'm going across the world to find out where that new technology is going to be to deliver the new generation of use cases. Why can't we have that here? How can we create the ecosystem to promote that? So for me, if that's from a there's a it's, it's, there's a nuanced conversation that's having from a federal discussion, a national conversation, as opposed to a, a state and territory. Yeah, thanks, Gavin, and thanks, panel. Uh, so great answers. Um, moving to standards. How can standards possibly address a, a fragmented situation in Australia? Thanks, and I think um, it was a great segue. Yep. <laughs> um, the panel's just talked a lot about, um, uh, you know, Australia not yet having a national strategy, um, a sort of coordinated national um, position to unlock the value of digital twin capability um, in our nation, um, and the white paper um, sets that out as a recommendation. Um this is where standards come in and where standards would be a really critical part of any sort of national um, coordinated strategy and indeed um, at subnational level as well. Standards really provide a, a common language, so nationally and internationally, um, meaning digital twin projects sort of start from the same, the same baseline and they really also provide the building blocks to scale outcomes. Um, I think I should, it's a good time to mention that there is standardisation work underway internationally uh, through the International Organisation for Standardisation and the International Electrotechnical Commission um, that will bring harmonisation to key components of digital twin and this includes this question of definitions and that's sort of the first cab off the rank, um, benefits or use cases um, and also maturity. And I guess the very last thing to mention about the benefit of standards is um, you know, the process, um, it's a consensus based process. Um, technical committees are, um, you know, comprised of really broad range of representatives, um, and it's sort of open participation and that's a real value, um, of standards too. Thank you, Claire. I think, yeah, I think, I think standards is definitely something we will, uh, touch on again in, later in the panel. If I could move to, um, key challenges in, or challenges that, businesses will face in actually rolling out digital twin. Um, Adam, Meredith, Gavin, what do you anticipate or what have you seen are the biggest, uh, what are the biggest challenges you've seen in businesses trying to use digital twin? There has been some pretty clear feedback over the past little while around lack of return of investment. Why would I do this? Why would I invest? Now that, comment alone obviously speaks to a couple of things that are obviously floating around in our mind. We obviously think digital twin is very expensive, maybe, um, and that potentially comes down to what we think it is and what the definition is, thus the value of standards, common language, you know, taking the guesswork out of it. So, so I think there's, there's certainly value, benefit, return on investment. Show that to me. And that's not unique to Digital Twin. We saw that with sustainability. We saw it with the green building movement. We're seeing it with net zero. You know, we're trying to understand what the what the benefit and potential outcomes are of our particular investment. So um, that ROI piece continues to be a bit of a barrier because I think there is an element that people think you've got to go and buy a Digital Twin. You've got to drop four and a half million to get your Digital Twin, the, your representation, because it's often seen the first image that, that sort of is shared when it comes to Digital Twin is a big digital model. You know, it looks very impressive and, and, you know, there's a lot in there. So, you know, expense and investment, I think, comes to mind first. Um, but we're seeing uh, a lot of on-ramps that aren't costly that really get us on a Digital Twin journey. We, we've got municipalities that have had GIS teams for decades, 
you know, building informa- information modelling is not new. We have early on ramps that are right there, low-hanging fruit. So ROI is a key one. Um, I think uh, I think also the use cases, people are wanting to see, touch and feel what those use cases are. Um, and they're out there uh, in, in, in spades, but we're not documenting them and we're not sharing them. Um, what you can find publicly is challenging at times. Uh, in part of the white paper, we looked at a, a, a sort of a, a crude assessment of where things are at state by state um, and, and you just can't find information. So I, I, I would be bold and provocative and say that I don't necessarily think we have a good sharing culture around what we're doing, whether that's competitive advantage, we're trying to sort of, or IP we think that we're, we're trying to hold on to, but, um, and, and we saw this with other uh, with, with other transformation agendas as well. So I think, um, I think, getting a nice open forum place where we can freely share what it is we're all doing is, is going to overcome some of those challenges and barriers. But there are two that I would highlight. Thanks, Adam. Um, Adam, I really like your point around it's what is true of a challenge for businesses in digital twins is similar in other sectors, particularly in the white space sectors. Um, at the IoT Alliance Australia, we've got over 500 members and a number of multi-cross-sectorial work streams and I think it's fair fair to say that we hear really similar cries from our members and it's ultimately comes down to getting the settings right getting the ecosystem right there's a sort of a recipe if you will a formula um, not tried and true not not 100 perfect for all of these different um, new and emerging technology sectors that we're seeing but we need to make sure that we are allowing the private sector to innovate that we are providing some policy consistency that the, we are have clear definitions and standards but equally that we're not relying on the private sector to pay for all of the capability development that's required and the thought leadership that's required to lift the capability, not just within the private sector, but perhaps within the communities and with, within government. So I think in response to the question in terms of what are we, what do I think the biggest challenge for industry at the moment is in terms of adopting digital twin, it's getting clarity of their voice and being able to share that burden um, and understand the ecosystem itself and define it. And I must say, I think that's one amazing thing that's coming out of the formation of the new digital twin partnership as well. It's a um, really great step to be able to start to clearly identify and um, articulate the subsectors of capabilities and skills that exist within the broader digital twin ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, just echoing on Adam's and Meredith's point, I think I look at it in different lenses. I think in terms of what we're seeing is there are better use cases and there are better business cases. And what we're seeing is the more successful business cases is having real detailed bottom-up return of investments, benefits, understanding what that value proposition is. I think that's really critical in combination of understanding about we've got to do better in terms of how we talk in government speak. So how's this going to improve housing? How's this going to provide more joined-up government thinking, coordinated infrastructure? And I think that's really important that we start to think about less in the technical language, but more talking back to government in their issues and their challenges. So I think from a, a leadership and strategic perspective, abs- that, that's a big challenge, I think, at the moment. Data is a huge challenge, and it's what I call the unsexy part of Digital Twin. A lot of people like the 3D glossy thrive through model in terms of is that sexy, but data is unsexy. Data is uninteresting to a lot of people. You talk a lot of bureaucrats, a lot of ministers, and they talk about data and they all switch off. However, Digital Twin is a master data management strategy. Okay, You need to be able to integrate and connect different types of data from disparate systems to help you solve a problem that you can't do now with your current technology. What we challenge with is our data is of poor quality within the built and natural environment. We treat it with not very much respect whether we procure it or whether we manage it, it becomes very difficult to actually operationalize the twin if we have poor quality uh, data, provenance of data. So that's something that's a huge challenge that we've got to, to move forward. And then standardization as well. How do we actually put more standards in place to actually ensure that whatever data and information you require for that use case is of the right quality? Because if you're working for a large infrastructure company and you're looking to feed in five data sets and there is little standards there, 
you're going to spend an awful long time in terms of cleansing up that data. So that's a real issue. And you know, so I haven't talked once about technology. Okay, technology is not the issue, but we should be more focusing on around in terms of that top-down leadership, business case development, but also around um, data quality. And then finally, the people component. We're not training people in terms of around digital twin. We're just expecting people to understand what digital twin is. Part of the digital twin partnerships, we go across the country. We've just been in Perth. We've been uh, to uh, Brisbane, uh, Sydney and Melbourne. There's still a lot of confusion there in terms of the people interchange the word digital twin when they're referencing geospatial, BIM, IoT, 3D laser scan. What we've got to do is how do we build up organisational capability so to deliver on uh, these programmes. Thank you, panel. Uh, some really interesting insights there around the challenges. And I think, Gavin, you mentioned standards, so I think a perfect segue to standards. Um, Claire, how can standard support industries overcome some of these implementation issues? Thanks, George. And I'll just pick up on a couple of things uh, that the panel just talked about. Um, first of all, I think um, at least a few of you mentioned use cases and you know maybe the fact that there's not a sharing culture in this area. And I think this is where standards um, are so important. As I said, use cases is often an early area of standardization and is in the case of digital twin. Um, and again, um, you know, the nature of the standards process is that it, there are a lot of voices contributing to this and those um, those use cases can be a foundation for that kind of, um, well, to help overcome that challenge. Um, basically, standards are a really important way of making sure we don't reinvent the wheel um, time and time again. So it does help, they do help address fragmented approaches um, and really in this case I think lay the foundation for a, a national digital twin uh, ecosystem, I think you use that word, Meredith, um, rather than standalone projects, um, for example, with data sets that that don't talk to each other. And I was glad you mentioned data, um, Gavin. I can see Dr. Ian Offerman here as well, who <laughs> if I didn't mention data here, um, we'd, I'm sure he'd have words. Um, it's not just digital twin standards we're talking about here. Um, there are a huge range of other standards that will underpin digital twin as well and data use and management, data use and sharing Um key among those um basically you know standards help provide trust i think um digital twin might not be implemented widely um unless it has been standardized um really rigorously and that and you know that trustworthiness is a part of that too yeah great thanks claire i think trustworthiness is a big piece and, and adam and, and gavin or adam you being uh, chairing the digital twin working group and gavin your participation did you have thoughts on sort of the standards piece and how standards can support that implementation? Yeah, I, I mean, standards are a beautiful thing because, first of all, they just bring us together with a shared understanding of what it is we're talking about and, you know, there's no shortage of, you know, a million different interpretations when it comes to digital twins. So um, when those standards drop in about 12, 18 months, Claire, that you mentioned, um, it's going to be fantastic because we've all been to those conferences and we've all seen the the snapshots that are on slide decks of what something means. You know, I can't wait in the digital twin space to start seeing the extract of that standard that starts going on slide decks because, you know, we, we then start to reinforce it. So just getting us on the same page, we know what we're talking about. Um, the other one for me, um, just like maybe data may not be sexy, procurement is even unsexier, but standards just play such a powerful part when it comes to, um, you know, pr the procurement process. And, you know, we're seeing it right now. I if it's not embedded or asked for or called up in procurement, the likelihood of it happening dwindles every day that we go on. So standards in the procurement process, absolutely key. And dare I say, finally, probably the other one for me that I've seen in other sectors uh, and industries is, um, is, is, is for exporting. You know, this is why international harmonization and definition is so key if we want to participate in a global economy that's getting you know more global every day and and frictionless when it comes to sort of doing business um making sure that we as a nation are on the same page as everyone else you know r really helps to you know to sort of participate in that very chaotic fast moving digital economy so um uh, in investing uh, and and then exporting for, for me is is um, something that standards underpin. Thanks, Adam, and I'm glad you mentioned the global 
sort of nature of standards. I think another thing Claire mentioned was that that common language. Um, it is dangerous in a way for for us in Australia to develop our own standards, where only Australians will understand what we mean. We de- we do need that that global language, and I think those ISO, IEC, JTC one standards on digital twin will help that common language approach. Um, going a bit broader than just digital twin, stake, taking a step back, um, standards are often it, that consensus. Um, based approach of standards mean standards development can often take a long time. I'm sure everyone involved in standards development has heard that complaint at least once. Um, how can standards actually keep up um, with the fast-paced environment of critical and emerging tech? So obviously digital twin being one of them, but other technologies as well. How can standards keep up? Um, thanks, George. Well, it's a um, great time to mention that Standards Australia um, is currently exploring um, new standards development pathways to, um, in some cases, speed this process up, um, keep making sure that our standards are fit for purpose and our processes are fit for purpose um, because critical and emerging tech especially, but not just, there are lots of other areas that are um, extremely fast moving and really critical to our national economic and security interests as well. Um, but, you know, areas like digital twin um, and critical and emerging tech is definitely a key one. Um, so the new pathways that we're exploring um, include things like project committees being constituted um, quickly in new areas, um, uh, Standards Australia being able to author proposals of strategic importance um, and also making it easier to adopt international standards. You mentioned, George, that... Um, you know, we're advocates of internationally aligned standards, so um, international standards where they make sense and Australian um, where those need tweaking as well. Um, I suppose another thing to mention at Standards Australia as well are teams like um, the one I'm in, Strategic Initiatives, um, and our research and analysis team um, who were really closely involved with this white paper. Um, you know, the newer parts of our business that are, um, you know, looking to help us address some of these big challenges. Thanks, Leah. No, great answer. And um, th- those um, alternative standards development pathway pathways are quite exciting. And I think you're right. I think Standards Australia have made inroads on, in some of these um, to, to address some of these areas, I think, which will be important going forward. And, George, I'm going to just interrupt you here too. Um, also, to give a shout out to our international contributors at this point. Um, you know, I've mentioned that the ISO IEC standards for digital twin are underway and um, – you know, it's always a good time to um, note the really hard work of our Australian experts who are on our National Mirror Committee but participating uh, in in these areas um, and, yeah, working very hard. So thank you to everyone, including some of our panellists. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Claire. And not easy, especially when a lot of the calls and the meetings are in the early hours of the morning. Um, my final question for the panel um, is I think we all have the view that Australia, we, sh- we think Australia should be a leader in digital twin. What are the core ingredients to ensure that remain that, that happens? What are the core ingredients Australia needs to become that global leader in digital twin? I'll go first. Absolutely. I think first of all what we've got to do from a, a national perspective is tie into policy, what are the strategic objectives are of Australia Commonwealth as a, as a national perspective, only then will we see in terms of movement happening in this space of leadership because if we maintain our, our current trajectory, uh, I use Anslick as a, as a really good example, hugely talented people who come together on very passionate people but on a shoestring. They turn up to their events, turn up to committees and do it as a hobby. So it's going to be very difficult to coordinate. I know the East Coast are are coordinating in terms of their digital twin programs, but if we maintain our current fragmented uh, trajectory, it's going to be very difficult for us to compete with other uh, more regional from from an Asian perspective. So linking in to, to, to policy, linking to strategic objectives on how digital twin can help drive some national agendas. I think for me that that leadership is, is, is critical. Otherwise, we will be hamstrung 
by continuing a, a state by state approach, which we, which we're happening at the moment. Thank you, Gavin. I, I think um, George, the white paper sets out, I think it's seven recommendations, which had that goal in mind. How do we not only lead locally here nationally, but but globally? I echo what Gavin says, we need to be a, a leader ourselves in our own backyard before we go international. But, you know, international leadership is um, is really important and structured in, in some elements, but it's also just being brave and having a go. Um, when it comes to standards development, there's some great ISO IEC standards for digital twin, absolutely critical, foundational, fundamentally, globally. There's nothing stopping Australia going out and filling in some of those gaps and then taking that up to ISO and filling in the gaps for, for everyone internationally. So I, th I think there's some really exciting opportunities where we can just sort of f fill the void in some instances um, and and, and not, be, not be afraid of having a voice. There's no perfect time for this, really. Um, the, the UK has been a bit of a global leader for a while with the Centre of Digital Built Britain. It's now morphed into something else. But I suppose I would say they were the international leader in our most recent times and th they were just vocal. They got out there. They did a lot of sharing, a lot of really basic functions that a nation would do to, you know, get itself above the noise. And I think I think sharing was a, was, was a real um, key factor in that. And... I think they did a really good job in making sure that it wasn't just technical. They had culture programs. They had a lighthouse program. Jump on the back of what's going on to sort of try it and show it and, you know, share lessons learned as well. And if there's one thing we do well in Australia, it's build stuff. And there's a lot of that going on. Um, and I think sometimes we just fear that we don't, we, we don't, haven't, we don't have it perfected yet. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, waiting around for perfection is, is, is actually, you know, hamstringing us into um, sort of holding back. Um, so uh, I, I think we can be a global leader, abs absolutely. Uh, we've got to find our voice and, and go for it. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to suggest that one of the things Australia already leads quite well in is trust. We um, – strong reputation for regulation, for policy, for quality of things that we produce and the process that the whole industry is currently going through at the moment around digital twins to produce a trusted process. A trusted outcome is really critically important and a large part of that really does have um, a lot to do with the great work of Standards Australia and Australia's regulatory strengths. But I'd suggest that trust itself is a really interesting one because it's not just about the trust of our citizens to allow us to use their data as we manage public places and spaces through digital twins. It's the trust of investors who want policy certainty as they come into our country or buyers as they want to be able to purchase, procure and integrate our solutions into the broader economic opportunities. And so I feel like uh, my favourite recommendation out of the paper today is actually the call for a roadmap. Obviously, we need leadership. We need a variety of different ingredients. But whoever, once that, that mantle is grasped, then a roadmap itself will be a little bit like a build it and they will come approach. It will outline the building blocks and the steps ahead that will attract the right kind of partners to the table to help actually deliver on the promise. Thanks, Meredith. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. So three things from me, I think number one, and this is from a standards perspective, um, for, you know, ensuring Australia can become a global leader in digital twin, um, continuing our active participation in international standard setting um, for sure. So we do have a seat at the table and active participants. Um, I'm sure the work will ramp up. Um, so there's always, um, you know, value in broader representation and, um, and there are opportunities for leadership in particular areas. Um, you know, Adam's mentioned that, um, well, first mover advantage um, is definitely the case in standards. Um, it could be that uh, Australian um, participants put forward proposals for new standards or, you know, support the drafting of, of new standards. So those are some examples. Um, number two is really the robust adoption of international digital twin standards. Um, I've already mentioned why it's so important. Um, so I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And I suppose number three is as well, you know, governments, regulators, um, the private sector using standards um, when rolling out digital twin projects um, to ensure that digital twin is interoperable, um, is trustworthy 
um, and really can reap the economic and social benefits that the panel's talked about today. Great. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, panel. I think we touched on some really uh, interesting points. We, we touched on standards, policy, people. So clearly a few <laughs> ingredients for Australia um, to lead in digital twin. Moving to the Q&A. Uh, so we've got the first question on Slido. Um, what do you see as the appropriate policy vehicles state by state to enforce digital twin standards? What additional mechanisms need to be in place to adopt? Uh, I can Clear. start here yeah. um, before Gavin. Um, I suppose, you know, Standards Australia's, well, standards um, are compulsory. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, compulsory. Um, voluntary, wrong word, <laughs> uh, a voluntary. <laughs> Um, uh, and so those policy vehicles uh, that the question is talking about are really important. And I guess that's why I just mentioned, um, you know, governments and regulators um, also taking up standards. Um, um, you know, those are the mechanisms that we usually see because, yes, standards are compo- uh, voluntary. I just did it again. Wow. <laughs> but government have got two levers that they can pull, uh, policy and procurement. Um I think there's more now we see around climate positive, net zero, whatever you want to define it. We're going to see how do we become more efficient in delivering, building, operating and servicing our, uh, our, our built environment. So I think from a policy perspective, whether that's from housing, whether it's from an infrastructure perspective and how digital and data can help with that. Procurement uh, really helps with that. So if you start to look at it in terms of uh, invoking standard requirements or information requirements, data requirements, standards, ISO 8000, et cetera, you start to get a bit more control. The biggest challenge we have is one thing about putting it into a contract. It's about validating that data. And we've seen that a lot where government procurement has uh, put some requirements for standards such as ISO 19650 into contract, but they're not necessarily validating that data. So that's really important only from a procurement perspective, a policy perspective, but also validating that that data as well to ensure you're getting what you're you're getting. So if you're asking for oranges, you're getting oranges, not not apples and bananas. I'd um add you might say government only has two levers, but I'd remind us all that there's multiple governments. So whether we're talking about local governments or state governments or in perhaps in the federal government, I, I would um, suggest that when we're looking at different policy vehicles that we consider all the different industries that digital twins, digital twin sector can touch, which ones are the most engaged currently, perhaps which ones which aren't as engaged in this conversation as they could be and that might offer a lot of opportunity to drive it forward, particularly around things like critical infrastructure, cyber, et cetera. We, we tend to come from it you often come to digital twins from a lens of either cities or perhaps advanced manufacturing. But I do think that as we start to integrate this across the full industry um, pillars, we will see opportunities for policy levers appear that will harmonise between sectors. Thanks, Meredith. Um, we've got another question on Slido. Uh, what is it about the properties of new digital twin standards that matters most? Openness, interoperability, how to motivate, incentivize different stakeholders from private sector, civil society, academia to participate in digital twin projects and share relevant data. A bit to unpack. Uh, I'm going to throw this one to the digital twin experts. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think when I when I look at the question, something that stands out to me is you know what what matters most. And I, I think we've had some good dialogue. We've been to those conferences. We've, we've sort of seen presentations of people unpacking digital twins. And again, visualization is a big part of that, how we communicate it. You know, there's just a, a human element behind all of this. We can, we can spend and invest as much as we want uh, in, in the, the technology and those, you know, really important aspects, the, the, the technical enablers. I, I think the human and the business enablers, they're a lot more squishy and they really matter. Um, so I, I think I would like to ensure that 
in in future digital twin standards work, we pick up on those. So as an example, you know, as Claire mentioned, there's a standard emerging right now for digital twin maturity, um, a, a maturity model, but it's only around technical maturity, right? The amount of data, the you know, the fidelity, frequency, how many dimensions, technical standards are generally technical things. Uh, I, I think the the properties that are going to matter most in this conversation are the are the people ones, um, because we can have a digital twin, but if we can't operate it, or we don't know how to extract value from it. Uh, we're going to be challenged. So um, there's a lot of technical references up there. I we need to make sure we don't lose sight of the non-technical capability and enablers. Thanks, Adam. Uh, moving to another question, is there a national digital twin strategy? If not, what could it potentially look like and what areas should it focus on? I haven't seen one. Um, I, I don't think there is one. I'm not saying that there isn't one, but I, I can't find it anywhere. Um, I think we need one. What could it potentially look like? I mean, let, let's not let's not sort of, you know, think that digital twin is different to any other transformation agenda i think um we know what strategies look like national strategies we have them for all different issues and um sectors and you know goals and plans um so yeah we don't need to overcomplicate it yeah just in, in addition to that, no there isn't a, a, a national strategy what what could it look like again i go back to in terms of we have to enable strategic objectives of commonwealth government it can't be just oh, it's nice to have a national strategy because we, we want one. It has to enable in terms of government policy, government strategic objectives, and that's really critical for that. Otherwise, we're just having creating one for, for argument's sake because all the technical heads say that we need one. So I think we've got to be very clear about what is the problem we're trying to solve. How, do we, how does a digital twin at a national scale help information sharing between jurisdictions? How does it help from an exports? How does it create a thriving marketplace to enable investment around technology in terms of from, from a digital twin perspective. So there's a whole raft of different agendas and um, focus areas, but I think it really needs, we need to think about what is the problem we're trying to solve first and foremost. I was just going to tie on to that, but also perhaps one of the last questions as well in terms of what could it potentially look like and what should it focus on? There are a whole raft of, of challenges. The opportunity right now, the really exciting opportunity right now is to throw a lasso around it and to start to really bed down those conditions that industry need to then be able to innovate and move forward and for private sector to be able to contribute to this. So articulating out what is the role of government and then leaving space for people to actually play and create and innovate. But importantly, I do think that if we're going to call out the Commonwealth government, we have to be able to articulate the why for digital twins that relates to the Commonwealth government. What is their mandate? What is their remit? What is their stake in this versus the state government as well and that's why i would encourage people to look at different industries and to not rule them out by getting too narrow with all problem definitions i think there's a lot of amazing examples of standards that are very specific and very narrow and at the moment as we're creating the digital twin standards the fact that it sits across a number of industries is very very opportunistic thanks meredith uh one more question on slido uh which countries are leading in the digital twin space and what are they doing right i know adam you mentioned the uk about 10 minutes ago. Uh, are there any other countries leading at the moment? Yeah, look, I think what we've, we're finding is there's pockets of excellence in each country. UK government have just recently closed their centre for digital Britain, but we know now that that's going into a new genesis of, of a new programme to perhaps focus more on uh, sectors as opposed from a national um, digital twin. We're seeing obviously Singapore gets talked about every, every digital twin uh, conference as Singapore has mentioned there's a whole raft of different things being done in the Middle East uh, in, in terms of Europe and you're seeing cities as well starting to lead as well so we're not seeing necessarily from a, a country perspective but we're actually seeing cities drive that and I think that's really interesting because typically when you talk about digital twin we talk about assets built assets but cities are talking about digital twin about delivering better public services I think that's really interesting and fascinating in terms of local government are at the face of the public and in terms of seeing some really interesting work there. So 
po- to, to answer, there's pockets of excellence globally, um, but it's up for grabs in terms of from a, a, a global leadership position. Thanks, Kevin. Now, we do have time for a few questions from the floor. If anyone has any questions, I'm sure we can get a mic and run a microphone over. Ian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Great discussion. Uh, this is probably the converted in the room. I'm just wondering what are your views, panelists' views, on on getting the message out more broadly and also making standards more accessible for people who typically wouldn't sit down and read one? The word's been thrown around a few times today, so I don't feel too nervous about saying it in public, but trust is sexy. So I think we really need to use language and lexicon that relates to the people and the public and what it means to them and to decision makers. So I liked your point, Gavin, around delivering better services for cities. People understand that now. Post-COVID, we've come out of, you know, a whole new world and it's an opportunity to use that jargon and to start using it to explain bigger and broader concepts. And, you know, um, I was really excited to hear and see that Standards Australia is now publishing more papers and being able to play that thought leadership role. I'm not saying that my mother's ever going to understand what Standards is um, or Standards Australia, the role that Standards Australia plays, but I do think that the process of coming together and collaboratively drafting these things is only going to get quicker and smoother. So the pub test for digital twins or my, at the test for your mum, but I do think it comes down to trust and I think that's something that Australia offers to the world and that Australia, the digital twins can offer to Australia. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just, I love that, Meredith, because when I run workshops I, and I get people to describe Digital Twin, I use the analogy, describe it like you're talking to your mother. And to your point, Ian, in terms of what and I think I mentioned it earlier, is we've got to do better in how we communicate what this thing is, what the problem we're going to solve. You're right. These type of events in terms of preaching to the converted, we run the risk of being an echo chamber because you go to these events, there's a lot of nodding heads. So how do we bring new people, new stakeholders, and how do we improve as a sector in terms of explaining what the problems we're trying to solve? So I mentioned earlier around talking about improving housing supply, land use, net zero, coordinated infrastructure, joined up government, actually focusing on if you, every uh, state government has a state infrastructure strategy, we should all be there relaying it back in that language in terms of what their objectives are, not in... My digital twin's amazing. It's going to solve you so many problems. Let me just take you through this sexy 3D model. Where can I sign? There is um, one uh, element that digital twins offers, perhaps the conversation that others don't, and that is the beauty of visualizations. We talk about how digital twins can help us to understand and analyze, but they really do help us to uh, communicate, particularly at that community level, even if it is just the beautiful fly-throughs that the New South Wales government can already do on some of our sites that are here or whether it is the sort of all bells, whistles and singing and dancing ones that come out of fancy places um, in the desert. Um, I do think that that's a language that's universal and you don't even need to speak English for it. I suppose what I was going to say, it's a great question, Ian, because we've we had the same with the Smart Cities agenda. You know, how many people really know what that is? And we had that with green building as well and I, I fall back on better, quicker, cheaper as a very basic bottom line for a lot of this transformation. Um, I, I remember being interviewed um, many years ago when one of the first uh, one of the first surveys was published around knowledge around smart cities, and it was it was shock horror in that twelve percent knew what smart cities was, uh, and it was a survey of consumers, which is a really important marketplace. And but the questions were. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, do you know what smart cities is? You know, and I thought to myself, well, smart cities are cities, right? So let's talk about, you know, ask the reframe the question. You know, do, do you do you think better transport is better? You know, better services. So sometimes we do, as you're saying, we get in our own echo chamber and we want to sort of put particular words in there. Um, that's why I like going back to, you know, do we want things better and quicker and cheaper? Uh, and I think that's an important one as well. We've got to demonstrate, this is where the, the ROI issue comes in, we've got to demonstrate value and, and return on investment. And I think COVID was interesting, being in the smart city space for a while, like of all, that, all those years of investment and all the, uh, all the proof of concepts, in our greatest time of need, how much of it 
really made a difference or, or helped us. So really bringing it back to fundamentals, value to the taxpayer. Um, are our rates getting cheaper from all of this in investment? I, I don't know. So I always like to use rates and taxes as sort of a, you know, a, a common metric in this, you know, is the taxpayer being saved money uh, at, the, at the end so that we can reinvest in other things. So I think there's ways in which we can make sure that it's a more meaningful conversation for more people. The last thing I'd add is, Ian, that's our daily ambition and challenge at Standards Australia. And two things, number one, um, you know, initiatives like this, so um, the white paper, breaking it down, um, pointing to the standards but also explaining why they matter um, and, and, you know, education around what standards are, what's coming down the pipeline and how are they applied. Um, the second thing I'd mention is, you know, our next gen program is a good example of where we are trying to get um, professionals across sectors interested and engaged in standards from really early on in their careers, um, find those standards champions um, and, you know, help people understand them and why they're so important. Claire, thank you, panel, and thank you, Ian, for the question. And I think that's actually a really a great segue to end this discussion because I think the aim of today was certainly not to announce that we've sort of reached our digital twin endpoint, much the opposite. Um, it was to actually bring the leaders in this space together and to actually start the conversation and uh, to outline the opportunity and the vision for Australia in digital twin. So I think in launching this digital twin white paper, there is genuine excitement about the role of digital twin and how digital twin will, digital twin will transform Australia, um, and I think we've also highlighted the value of standards and standards as that missing piece of the puzzle um, to ensure that digital twin uptake isn't actually fragmented in Australia. So a massive thank you to our panel, uh, and thank you to all who attended the uh, session today. For those uh, online, I wish you a good day or a good evening from where you're watching, and for those here in person, we'd love for you to stay and continue the conversations we've had today. I, I get the sense there are a few more questions, so please do stick around. Um, and on behalf of Standard Australia, thank you for your attendance.